And before this video begins, I'd just like to give a special thank you to my Asbantium level patron, Fallon Cortez. Thank you for supporting the channel. Good evening all my fine time friends, are you ready for another exciting Doctor Who review? Super! Let's go! Oh, sorry about that, I kind of blacked out for a second, I don't know what happened. We're now just beyond the midpoint of Doctor Who series 14. It's been a pretty experimental series, to say the least. Even last week's episode was an absolute mind-bending puzzle that divided the fanbase. And Dot and Bubble is definitely one of those two things. Yes, the newest polarising Doctor Who episode plunges us into the sickly, sweet and fake world of fine time as a bunch of vapid, spoiled, rich kid influencers are being eaten alive by slug friends. It's quite the Skibbity Ohio moment, no cap. But if you thought this episode was going to be full of that kind of cringe, you'd actually be wrong. Despite its obvious Black Mirror setup, Dot and Bubble isn't Russell T Davis yelling at a cloud for 45 minutes about how phones are bad. Instead, it tells a much deeper, darker story with one of the most sobering endings of the whole show. But is Dot and Bubble good? Well, as always, that's what I'm here to find out. So, without any further ado, join me for a trip into the social media hellscape of Dot and Bubble. As we watch protagonist Lindy Pepper Bean's morning routine, we get a glimpse at the apparently utopian fine time. A futuristic world of bright pastel colours, sunny days and forced toxic positivity. I love the visual direction of Dot and Bubble. It does such a great job of bringing this aggressively fake world to life. It's the very obvious dissonance of this seemingly perfect and beautiful world which hides a lot of darkness and social grime underneath. Is it generic? Of course, it's one of the easiest sci-fi stories to tell. I mean, spin a wheel of Star Trek episodes and you're almost guaranteed to land on one where the crew arrive in a wonderful, welcoming utopia that actually ends up being evil. But I don't think it's inherently wrong that Doctor Who uses this kind of setting for Dot and Bubble. After all, it's a trope because it works so well so often. Fine Time is this little society where rich people can send their adult kids to work two hour jobs and spend the rest of their time partying and gossiping, sheltered in this beautiful yet ultimately empty dome, a literal bubble. Like I said, Fine Time looks amazing, flexing the higher budget with ease and style. It's the exact that kind of visually striking, futuristic setting I love to see in Doctor Who. With a lot of interesting architecture and design choices making it feel not only futuristic, but worlds away, whilst simultaneously being incredibly familiar to what our own future may hold. And hey, it even has the best Doctor Who character. The one, the only, Doctor P. What a man. The most instantly noticeable thing about Fine Time is the titular Dot and Bubble, a type of AI device with a social media platform thing built into it, allowing everyone to talk to each other and follow one another at will. Although I'm not sure exactly how it all works in universe, it's kind of nebulous. And naturally, like the cold open shows, the denizens of Fine Time are glued to their pop-up displays 24-7 and can't do anything without its guidance, like the aforementioned Dr. P, who informs you whether or not you need to pee. You know, heroes don't wear capes. Obviously, I was quite worried about the setup. It can very easily devolve into boomers complaining about youths these days being too obsessed with their phones and not looking where they're going. And if this story was made in 2010 for Series 5 like it apparently was originally pitched for, it probably would have been very out of touch like that. But luckily, it manages to nail the perfect balance here. Yes, there are obviously moments poking fun at people being unobservant as they walk into slugs or struggle to even walk without their HUD arrows, but that's not the extent of the social commentary, it's just a piece of the wider satire. The episode also highlights things like the need for constant stimulation. Anyone who tries to slow things down and talk about normal, serious things is dismissed as being boring, despite themselves being the boring and shallow ones. You can even see heartthrob superstar Ricky September as a bit of an analogue for like TikTok people, since he just lip syncs to songs and becomes famous for it. So there's a lot of widespread social media satire throughout the episode beyond the obvious surface level stuff. Dot and Bubble also subtly hints towards subscribers and followers being social status symbols, much like Black Mirror's Nosedive famously did. But it doesn't repeat that plot and just leaves it as a bit of subtext and world building implication, which is really nice. Anyway, speaking of subscribers, why don't you hit those like and subscribe buttons? Buttons. But, but, but. If you don't, I'll send the slugs after you. The protagonist of Dot and Bubble is Lindy Pepperbean, whose ridiculous name is commonplace amongst people like Hoochie Pie, Blake Very Blue, and 
Harry tendency. It's all a bit balamory. Lindy is immediately established as a bit of a walking stereotype. Like everyone else, she's glued to her screen and very self-absorbed, only ever really thinking of herself and her image. She's not exactly introduced as an ambitious go-getter we instantly gel with like Sally Sparrow before her, and that turns out to be very deliberate later on, but I'll get to that later. Lindy is incredibly dismissive of the Doctor and Ruby when they try to appear in her bubble to help her, and she continues to display a clear lack of empathy throughout the narrative, only scared when she herself is under threat. There's a great moment where she's told a bunch of her friends are dead, and she can't bring herself to even slightly pretend she actually feels upset about that. She's basically just, Oh no, my friends are dead. Oh no. Anyway. Lindy is a brilliant character in that regard, so devoid of empathy or basic sincerity because her society looks down on things like that. We constantly think she's going to be redeemed or face some sort of realisation that she's a horrible person, but she never does. If anything, she gets worse and worse towards the end of the episode. You're not meant to like Lindy, but the episode does just enough to make you feel like she can become a better person. So you do end up somewhat rooting for her to survive for at least a majority of the episode, because she simply seems like a product of such an isolated, digital-only society with no common sense or imagination. I actually love that the song she shows so much affinity for is one all about a girl scared to come out wearing a bikini because she's afraid someone will see her, you know, going against the status quo like this. So she spends her time hiding and covering herself up. You can see the symbolism to how that obviously relates to Lindy being so scared to shut down her dot and bubble, because it means she would have to face the real world and other people, something she's not used to and so it terrifies her, because it's going against the status quo and the grain. I don't know if the song choice was intentional for that symbolism, but it matches her reliance on the dot and bubble so well. She doesn't even know what hugging is like because she's so starved of physical interaction. You may have noticed that I haven't spoken or shown much of the Doctor and Ruby yet, and that's because they're not really in this episode much. During the production of Dot and Bubble, and Shooty Gatwa still had filming commitments for sex education. So much like 73 Yards, Dot and Bubble is a Doctor-like story, minimising his role. However, it takes an approach much like Blink in Series 3, following this one-off protagonist with the Doctor and the Companion guiding them from a screen, trying to help that character navigate the perils around them and save the day without being able to physically do anything themselves. I think it's handled quite well, with the Doctor and Ruby able to hijack Lindy's system and pop in and out to talk to her and guide her wherever they can. I think it's a smart way to deal with the filming limitations, regularly reminding us that the Doctor and Ruby are there and pushing the narrative onwards, but on able to actually get into the city or stop the slugs, so it forces Lindy to make her own decisions and take action for herself. Obviously, it is a shame to have yet another episode minimising the roles of the Doctor and Ruby, that's three in a row and there's only eight episodes in the series, so it feels like we're not getting to spend as much time as we should with these characters. But I still think it works fine for this episode, especially because it feels more like a traditional Doctor episode to me, mixing things like Blink, The Girl Who Waited and The Bells of St John, so it feels very familiar in a way I've desperately needed all series, and the regular appearances of the Doctor and Ruby really help keep the pacing flowing well, and they keep Lindy on track by giving her purpose and inspiration, even if she is incredibly difficult, passive-aggressive and dismissive of them, especially the Doctor, for reasons that become abundantly clear at the end. Anyway, the reason the Doctor and Ruby are trying to contact and guide Lindy is because the city is overrun with the Man Traps, or the Slug Friends. These giant slow-moving slug creatures look absolutely brilliant in Doctor Who's classic campy monster style. Millennium FX brought them to life superbly. They really look so unsettling and slimy. One of my Discord mods pointed out that they look like something out of Lethal Company, and I think that's so accurate. Like, imagine running down a corridor right into the gaping maw of one of these horrible slugs. That would just be terrifying. The Man Traps are one of those goofy Doctor monsters that have no right to be scary but still manage to unsettle you. They basically just sit there and wait for people to blindly walk into them because the episode later reveals that the slugs were created by the Dots, which have become sentient and understandably despise the selfish, vapid and uninspired people who walk all over them. I mean, if you had to spend years, maybe even decades or centuries serving these people, it's understandable that you would want to kill them. I have seen 
some people question why the dots created the slugs when they're shown to be able to kill on their own accord, but I feel like it's them proving a point. The dots are sentient, so I feel like they create the slugs out of a sense of sadism, wanting to expose the people's blind ignorance and reliance on this technology. It would be too quick and easy, almost unsatisfying to kill the people directly, but by creating these creatures for them to blindly walk into, the dots would be feeling a sense of justice and smug satisfaction that their human masters are too dumb to think for themselves and die because of their own hubris. In a sense, I think it's just a classic case of malicious compliance. The dots are still doing everything the humans asked them to do, even if that means leading them right into the waiting embrace of a slug friend. It's also notable that these rich, young, problem-free influencers are so out of touch that even when this entire community has been slowly dying over the course of a week, they only notice it once it starts to affect their own circle. Even when they do pick up on all these mysterious absences, they just pretend it doesn't exist because they're so childlike in that sense. If they pretend there's nothing wrong, then nothing can hurt them, exactly how children think. Hell, one of the most illuminating moments is the recurring appearances of gothic Paul as he begs Lindy to investigate their friend's vanishing, only for him to then mockingly dismiss her when she tells him the truth of what's happening. Even he refuses to accept the truth because it means changing his worldview and admitting there's a problem, questioning reality in a way they're not encouraged or raised to do because they're incapable of actual free thought. It even takes a lot for the Doctor and Ruby to convince Lindy to simply put down her bubble and look around her office, where a man trap is busy devouring her co-worker. It shows just how sheltered and willfully ignorant this entire snobby utopia is. Without the safety and comfort of their online echo chambers full of people who look and act like them, constantly agreeing with them and complimenting them, they have to face the reality that they don't actually have any skills or personality, they don't matter, something that probably scares them even more than their own impending deaths. However, one man in fine time doesn't rely on his dot, and ironically, it's the biggest superstar of them all, Ricky September. I actually love this character. He's introduced as this megastar influencer who everyone in the city worships and fawns over. So you assume that he is the worst, most vain one of them all. Because you know, we always judge by appearances. But when he saves Lindy from a four-way slug embrace, we learn that he's actually the most down-to-earth and sincere person in all of fine time. He admits that he only uses his dot to post his songs and then logs off and spends the rest of the day reading books and learning useful information. He's like a normal, well-adjusted person. Ricky isn't terminally online, he isn't spending 10 hours a day arguing on Twitter, he's just normal. Which again is ironic considering his status within the community. I do love how as you're watching the episode you keep expecting him to be some sort of twist villain, because there's no way he could be that genuinely nice and sincere. He has to have some sort of ulterior motive, but he really is just a nice guy with decent morals and a sense of appreciation for the real world. And he even seems more open-minded, you know, when he comes across the Doctor. He doesn't seem to have any level of disgust like Lindy does. This subversion further feeds into the overall commentary because Ricky's open honesty and sincerity makes him seem distrustful when it's actually everyone else in the society who is deceitful and self-absorbed, so willing to betray each other despite seeming kind of innocent like Lindy is at the start. It works so well in my opinion. Indeed, much like the Doctor, Ricky comes swooping into the world of Lindy and saves her life, dragging her away into danger and adventure and excitement. Although I do find it weird how someone who couldn't even walk without bumping into a lamppost five minutes ago can suddenly sprint normally. That's kind of funny and weird. Anyway, the Doctor and Ruby give Lindy directions to an escape route out of the city, with Lindy and Ricky entering the rusted and mechanical underbelly of fine time, a stark contrast to the sleek and seemingly perfect world up above. It harkens back to a time when people actually had to work and use physical skills, something that feels so alien to Lindy and Ricky, who feel so so privileged and safe with everything they have to do. And like I mentioned, Ricky is basically the doctor, so he has no issues with the Pulse Coast needed to open a big industrial door to freedom. What a guy. But here's where the episode really starts to ramp up with some phenomenal writing. When the Dot is revealed as the true antagonist and starts attacking Lindy for being next on the alphabetical kill list, Ricky heroically fends it off to allow Lindy to open the door. But despite this, and despite being his love interest fawning over him for the entire episode, Lindy suddenly betrays Ricky by revealing his true surname as Coombs, meaning the Dot kills him and allows her enough time to escape. 
This is such an incredible and cold betrayal. The acting is phenomenal as you see Ricky standing there confused and broken hearted, double crossed despite trying to help this woman. He's almost shocked she'd do something like this because he spends so much time grounded in the real world with a sense of optimism and hope. He doesn't allow himself to get sucked into the cynical and bitter bubbles. But here Lindy does something so cold and evil without even a second of hesitation. Because she's so selfish and two-faced like that, because that's the world of fine time. I think one of the most chilling things about Lindy's instant double cross is how real it feels. It very much feels like that classic first Davis era writing where characters act how most people really would, even if most of them wouldn't admit it. When faced with a scenario like this, a lot of us would scrabble for literally any thread, any way to survive. Even even if that means throwing someone else under the bus to save our own skin. And that's why Lindy's betrayal is so frustratingly brilliant, because it's so real and accurate to actual human self-preservation. Throughout the episode we've seen how quickly and easily she throws away people who don't further her own means, and now Ricky has served his purpose. She just discards him, and then essentially forgets about him, along with straight up lying to the Doctor by pretending Ricky sacrificed himself to save her in some big heroic moment, and obviously the Doctor doesn't buy that actually explanation one bit. It's so cold and evil, immediately showing that there's no path of redemption for Lindy. She's had glimmers of hope here and there, but the fundamental core of Doctor Who as a show disavows this kind of behaviour, and Lindy doesn't even care about what she's done. She takes like two seconds to compose herself, and then immediately reverts back to her chirpy fake persona because she doesn't have the empathy or emotional capacity to process taking someone else's life, or what it even means to die because she's naive and like a child due to her privileged and sheltered life. Lindy makes it to safety where she's reunited with her friend and finally meets the Doctor and Ruby in real life. After a very incredibly insincere thank you to the people who literally saved her, we discover that the survivors plan on travelling to the dangerous wild woods outside the dome to settle and start a new life, because the original planet they're from was wiped out by the Chad Slugs. And yeah, you know, I'm sure this small group of privileged influencers who can't even work two hour days will manage to survive in a frontier with no materials or assistance. I'd be surprised if the boat even makes it halfway down the river before capsizing and they all drown because they have literally no survival skills and probably don't even know how to swim properly. I mean, the only guy in the whole city who actually read useful books just got his brain punched in by a ball bearing. So I don't give them very long. It exposes a shocking level of naivety within all these characters and the little bubble they're in. They're so used to everything working out for them and being handed to them, so they assume that they can just sail off into this paradise and nothing will go wrong because they don't know the actual hardships their pioneer ancestors would have faced. And you know, the whole idea of pioneers is also touches upon colonialism and stuff like that too, which further emphasises the overall metaphor of them being so privileged. The idea of naivety is furthered as Lindy discovers her Susan Twist mother is dead. When someone is told their beloved mother has died, you expect them to be sad, to probably cry or need a moment to compose themselves due to the shock, especially right away. But Lindy has almost no reaction, because she has an almost childlike understanding of death. Hell, even Splice, a literal child in Boom, had more of a nuanced and developed understanding of death, needing time to grieve and process what has happened. But in Dawn Bubble, these grown adults just don't care that people are dead. They don't grieve because they don't even understand that they have to. They're so sheltered and so naive that they don't even think about death or what it means. Without empathy, Lindy can't actually fathom the weight of her family being dead and immediately defaults into her toxic positivity because of her echo chamber, claiming her mum is lucky to be going to the sky, which again is almost exactly how Splice described her mum's death in Boom. And to remind you if it isn't already obvious, one of these is a literal actual child and another is an adult. Lindy's descent into full-blown villain material is firmly cemented with a reveal that she's just a straight-up racist. Yeah, at the end, the Doctor and Ruby offer to take all the survivors away in the TARDIS to another planet, where they can actually settle without instantly dying the moment someone gets a lake tick on their leg. Honestly, I absolutely adore how the air is just sucked out of the scene the moment Lindy says the Doctor isn't one of us, going on about it being his duty to save her, which, you know, the overtones are clear. And the thing I love the most is all of this 
this was actually obvious from the very beginning. Fine Time's innate racism was hiding in plain sight the entire episode, but for a lot of people, it's not immediately clear on first viewing. When the Doctor first appears on Lindy's feed, it has this big warning sign saying, unsolicited request, to which she immediately makes a disgusted face and blocks him without consideration. Then when Ruby appears on her screen, a blonde, young, white woman, there's no warning sign, there's no immediate block, she actually engages with Ruby, albeit with a sneer, probably because she's got a northern accent. And later on, when the Doctor returns to Lindy's feed, she straight up claims she thought he was a different black guy who just looked the same, which is obviously very racist and doesn't really need much analysis because it's so obvious. In Doctor Unleashed, Russell T Davis says it's interesting to ask yourself how far you get into the episode before you notice everybody in fine time is white, which is one of those things you either immediately notice or remain oblivious to depending on your own life experiences or unconscious biases, which is really clever and thought provoking commentary on casual racism and racial echo chambers. I think it says a lot about the Doctor's strength of character that even after being spoken to like this and dismissed purely for the colour of his skin, he still begs Lindy to let him save her. After all, he knows the impossibility of their chances. He's trying to flex his authority in classic Doctor Who fashion, but it just doesn't work because it doesn't matter what he says, they would never listen to him or give him the time of day. Which is a fantastic subversion of how the Doctor is usually able to operate and talk anyone over to his side, more or less. But this time, yeah, like I said, it doesn't matter what he says, they're never going to listen to him. And the absolute best wrinkle of this whole ending is how different it would have been if this was someone else asking them. Because Lindy does actually love the Doctor. She would gladly grab his hand and run with him into the stars. How do we know this? Because we've already seen it. That's why Ricky September is written so much like the Doctor, with his unbridled optimism, intelligence, patience, and willingness to charge into danger like a man of action. Because it shows us that quite literally the only thing Lindy dislikes about the Doctor is his skin colour, because she fears contamination. Which again is such excellent writing exploring how blind racism can be, and how someone's skin colour doesn't change who they really are underneath. Lindy isn't comically racist or like a character from the 1950s, she's racist in a very real modern way and that again works fantastically for showing just how evil and despicable this woman and her whole community are. When you create a black incarnation of the Doctor, it's inevitable that racism will have to be addressed in some form, mainly because of Earth's own history and ongoing racial issues. Writers suddenly have to think differently about how characters or settings might react to the Doctor, compared to him being a white man without challenges or limitations being imposed upon him. It's something we also saw with Martha, who faced racist remarks from Shakespeare, and even more overtly racist remarks from the boys in human nature. A moment like this was always going to happen with the 15th Doctor, and I love how they play it in this final scene, especially considering it was in Shooty Gatwa's first ever scene filmed after the giggle. So I mean, you know, trial by fire. The Doctor has to face a situation he literally can't win out of no fault of his own. The Doctor has no control over this ending because he's doing everything he's always done. His skin colour is just being used against him to discredit him. Gatwa is phenomenal here, begging them before laughing at the absolute stupidity of it all. He has to laugh because he's trying to hold back that frustration he soon shows. I know a lot of people have criticised the amount the 15th Doctor cries, but I think it's perfectly deserved here, because it's tears of anger and frustration, knowing that these few survivors would rather sail off to their deaths just because they don't like that he has a different skin colour to them. And he's forced to watch Lindy's smug smile as she departs, knowing he could have saved her even though she holds these immoral values. You know, she's so certain she's doing the right thing and, you know, sticking true to those fine time values, when actually they're just sailing to their deaths out of short-sighted stupidity and it's just so frustrating as both the viewer and for the good characters in the story which is amazing writing. The Doctor is furious about that selfish stubbornness on display and Murray Gold's music is on another level here. Finally a truly standout track from series 14 that isn't just a character theme. It really sells the despair and climactic emotion of the moment and dramatically increases the weight of the themes on display. Lastly, I want to talk about another great element of this ending, seeing what happens when the Doctor is faced with a society not worth saving, which is so interesting, because the bad guys survive, at least until five minutes after the episode ends, and they all die as soon as someone tries to drink some water out of the lake without boiling it. 
We've seen this idea a few times in Doctor Who, like Rixton Slade in Voyage of the Damned and Fenton in Flatline. The Doctor doesn't have the right to choose who lives or who dies. As he outright says to Lindy and the other survivors, it doesn't matter what they think or how they feel about him, he just wants them to let him save them, because it's still the right thing to do in his morals. It's always a big challenge to the Doctor's morality to put him in situations with immoral characters like these, testing just how far he would go for people who he hates because it's still the right thing to do. Good people like Astrid and Ricky die, whilst bad people like Rixton and Lindy survive. But the Doctor knows that's just the way it is sometimes, and he has no right to say otherwise, because it would make him a monster to start judging who deserves to live and die. It's why he even extends chances to out Right, monstrously evil characters like Davros and the Toymaker because he considers it his duty to try and save everyone no matter what. So I just think it's a great mini character study to pit 15 against these racist characters and for him to still look past that to try and save them. But much like with the slugs, it's their own hubris that ultimately costs them because again, there's no way they survive this attempt to be pioneers. When Dot and Bubble was announced, I expected it to be a really cringe Black Mirror wannabe making very surface level criticisms of social media and phone use, but it really surprised me with a lot of great deep storytelling and social commentary. The production design is very sleek and high budget, the performances are delightfully despicable, and it really takes you on this powerful journey through a dark future where echo chambers are taken to their logical extremes and society as a whole suffers as a result. The slugs are perfectly goofy Doctor Who villains with a lot of deeper layers, which is excellent, showing how little independent thought the fine time people possess, blindly trusting the same AI dots that now orchestrate their horrific deaths with sadistic precision. The story could have suffered big time by being both Doctor Light and Companion Light, but I think it works very well within the narrative, and it actually helps to further illustrate the themes of racism and classism as a black man and a northern girl try to save a society that looked down on them both. Honestly, Dawn Bubble might just be the sleeper hit of Series 14. I'd even give it an A rank because it's such a tight story that really nails the ending. Probably, in my opinion at least, the first great ending of the whole series. I think Dot and Bubble flies by with snappy pacing and a fascinating world, with so many great details and implications woven within, so it really works great on rewatches. It's probably the first episode, to me at least, that has felt truly like Doctor Who. I mean, don't get me wrong, the others have felt like Doctor Who too, of course, especially Boom. But something about Dot and Bubble just really reassured me that this show is the same one I fell in love with all those years ago. I just really love it, even if it is a bit divisive. Like, sure there are logistical issues with the dots killing based on the alphabet and some other bits here and there, but I just found it a really solid and enjoyable episode with an incredible amount of depth and sci-fi commentary. You know, I've seen a few complaints that the characters are so unlikable and hateable and it's kind of like, that's the point? You're not meant to actually like these people, you're meant to hate them because, yeah, they're very bad people. And of course, this episode introduced us to Dr. P, which speaks for itself. Anyway, what did you think of Dot and Bubble? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Let me know in the comments down below, and I'll see you in the next one for my least anticipated episode. It's Bird Bridgerton time. God help me. And as always, bye bye. And I'd just like to give an extra special thank you to my Asbantium level patron, Fallon Cortez, my Diamond level patron, Glenna Clark, my Platinum level patrons, Matthew Burns and Maximilian Foreman, and all my Gold level patrons, Chris Douglas, Daniel Shillito, the three Railway Engines, Thomas R, and Thomas Price. Thank you so much for your support.